This reminds me of more than 50 years ago, up the street on 725 North Wolf in the old basic sciences building, uh, Professor Leninger holding journal clubs, and it, it was also a quiet business, uh, quiet eating and drinking, and he, although he looked uh, like sleeping, he would wake up immediately if there was anything to be said, and it happened. And you learned very quickly to, to make a good presentation uh, during these journal clubs. So this is um, what I like about this. So uh, it's, it's like a journal club today. And uh, so uh, I would like to come back to two, to, two points made uh, earlier. Uh, it is uh, really how to have the cake and eat it at the same time. This is what we're trying to do. And so I'm number eight on the list, and I still hope to tell you a little bit new, which hasn't been said before. And uh, Julia uh, impressed me in her presentation by two things which I just didn't, really, didn't forget. One, number one, the new generation of young people coming in who are not impressed by old stuff, and they just come and want and do. And the other was no further funding into uh, some sort of research. And I think these are new ideas, and we should keep them in mind and maybe even practice that. So this is, I think, very important. Pharmaceutical development uh, marketing and pharmacovigilance to keep the drugs on the market uh, is among the most tightly regulated areas. Legislation is all around. And once you're bound by legislation, it's, it's not so easy uh, to get away from it. And so I think it's important to look at what despite gen of the legislation uh, has happened over, over time. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. So this presentation will um, look a little bit at European legislation, which is very similar to American legislation, which is very similar to other legislation. Uh, and I will have a look about legislation and LD50, because this was the first test in pharma, pharmaceuticals testing, which everyone wanted to get rid of. Um, that includes discussion about LD50 versus acute toxicity, and there was a scientific drive to, uh, to go away from merely pure uh, LD50 testing and do a toxicity test in an acute way. Um, we will look a little bit at chemicals and pharmaceuticals, just remember that many of the cosmetics ingredients which are not tested in the cosmetic have been tested as chemicals before. This is a, another story which I will not address any further. Um, I will look with you together at the International Conference at the International Council on Harmonization. Um, I will then look at reprotox testing, um, starting with a European initiative leading to a ICH guideline. And then I will shortly address, also repeat those toxicity testing. I heard these horrible stories about one-year dog studies, which are not used in pharmaceutical testing. And I will also shortly address carcinogenicity testing and is it needed. And all over, this, um, the, the activities which I'm going to describe have led to a decrease in the numbers of animals required for marketing, uh, and that, that's very important. And we always have to look at those experiments which have to be provided for marketing authorization, and we have to look at those experiments which have to be provided during and before clinical testing. So this is not the same. So here we look at the European pharmaceuticals legislation, um, this is the so-called first directive, and it is in the wake of thalidomide. 
Um, and of course, in the wake of the Little Might, everyone created legislation which was as tight and tough as possible. So it took as long as until 1965 to have a first European legislation on pharmaceuticals, which was then overriding any national pharmaceuticals legislation, piece by piece. So uh, it's almost 60 years, if we look at this, that this first uh, directive came into force. And uh, it was a European Union regulated animal experimentation for pharmaceuticals, only for pharmaceuticals. And among other tests, there was an LD50 test. And it's written down here, LD50 performed in rodents and acute toxicity performed in non-rodents served to calculate both the dose range for chronic toxicity testing and the lowest dose for early clinical investigation. Now, by now we know it's not that easy. Calculations are much more complicated and they can go wrong. So this is the, the text uh, from the next uh, uh, European uh, piece of legislation, Council Directive, from 1975. And I've put in red the, the details uh, and its very detailed requirements of LD50 testing. <coughs> and this is 1975. The study will cover the symptoms observed, including local reactions. Where possible, the LD50 value with the fiducial limits 95%, and you can imagine how many animals you will need for that, will be determined. The period during which the test animals are observed shall be fixed by an MS, etc. Uh, the acute toxicity test must be carried out and at least two mammalian species of known strain, etc., etc. So it shows you the rigidity, and it was impossible in those days to have escape. And this is, I think, what we have to look at when we look at today. And uh, we have to look at quite a lot of changes. So in summary, these two directives, 1965 and 1975, required preclinical testing of LD50 with uh, statistical limits to be performed in rodents, not in non-rodents. So finally, in 81, 1981, uh, there was big discussion starting about the use of LD50 testing versus the testing of acute toxicity. So it was not any discussion about removing a test, but it was a discussion about changing from one text which was recognized as not being very useful into another one, into the acute toxicity testing, where lethality was not the predominant interest. And this uh, came up for any, any substance, chemicals, or medical problem. It is no problem. And this led to what I call scientific lobbying, which is absolutely important if you want to be successful. And of course, I, I put here uh, 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 papers by myself and uh, Gerhard Spinden, and the two of us, me on the regulatory side and Gerhard on the university side, we were working together. We traveled to Tokyo and talked to the uh, Japanese Society of Toxicology. And in those days, LD50 in Japan was just normal as eating bread. And we explained to them that we had to work together in order to come forward with something better than LD50. And I put down the publication of Klingerman because this really is, is an interesting story. Uh, what Roger Curran explained for the uh, local toxicity for eye testing, uh, this was also true for LD50. Depending on who did it, what strain of animals was used, etc., the source of the material, you would get numbers all over the places. So it showed that the validity of the numbers obtained was zilch, was not available. So that's why I think this paper is very important. It shows that in detail. We are giving long lists of numbers uh, about LD50s which have been tested. And finally, 
Uh, Ellen Goldberg edited nicely a paper by myself and Gerhard Spinden, where we came forward with alternative approaches and tried to say why uh, uh, the, the testing uh, has to be done in a different way. Now, just to remind you about LD50, the idea was to go from the green point to the red point and to have as much difference in dose between these two points as possible. And of course, this may occur very seldomly because normally you have a smaller distance between the therapeutic uh, activity and the lethal action, and you don't have always curves in parallel. They go all over the place. And if you have that, the value of LD50 goes down to zero. And this was finally recognized. And uh, in 75, the guidelines still required LD50 test. In 87, the, uh, and it, it was legislation. It was written in legislation. And how to change legislation, everybody knows how difficult it is. So in 87, there was a revision of the annex to the directive. This is uh, European particulars, and I will not bury you and b uh, bother you with that. Uh, so there was a note for guidance on single-dose toxicity testing, not focusing on LD50. And this was used as a template for the respective ICH guideline, which no longer exists. In 2001, um, we had a new note for guidance for acute toxicity testing. <coughs> and for the first time, you see here a differentiation between a chemical substance becoming a pharmaceutical and a biotech substance becoming into a medicinal product. And here you see that there was a lot of thinking put into it and that the testing for biotech products had to be different because of their uh, the different by behavior. So this, I think, was a very important uh, point in time. Now, in 2010, finally, the note for guidance on single-dose toxicity testing was withdrawn. And this was not withdrawn in Germany. It was not withdrawn in Europe but it was withdrawn in ICH countries, which means, in the beginning, United States, Japan, and Europe, and Canada, and Australia, and others attached to it. So it's practically uh, more than 80 or 90 percent of the companies having performed the test now were no longer obliged to do such a testing. So uh, I think this is important that really uh, by working together, which has been stressed before, uh, working together in the ICH system, which I will explain to you a little bit, uh, the guideline on acute toxicity testing disappeared, and the questions previously addressed into the acute toxicity testing had been incorporated into repeated dose testing. And I think it's, it's a very good place to keep it there. So, in summary on that, up to approximately 1,000 animals, maybe even more, previously included in these studies are no longer required. Uh, this was achieved uh, in 2010. Uh, so, and if you look at 1965 to 2010, this gives you about the time span needed to change legislation with a true scientific drive in it. So it's, it, it, it works, it works. So uh, repeat those, start, uh, those toxicity studies. They have changed preclinical studies into non-clinical studies because um, instead of performing various routine tests before going into clinical trials, this is now a together, a get-together of, uh, of non-clinical studies and clinical studies. And this is uh, doing the non-clinical studies just in time, not too early and not too late, 
but previously they were usually performed too early. And this is why they were done in many cases when today we would say it's not, no longer necessary to do studies. So these studies are adapted to the clinical needs, and this varies from first in men to post authorization safety and efficacy studies and so on. So, and this then in the repeat dose toxicity study is accommodated as what we say single ascending dose studies in small groups of animals to repeat dose studies lasting up to six months. And I mentioned already that dogs are only tested six months and not 12 months, which was mentioned before for other areas. And uh, chemicals are tested for toxicity. Is there anything bad which we don't want? Pharmaceuticals are developed to hopefully uh, do something good from bench to bedside. And we have to look at pharmaceutical and biological quality. We have to look at the non-clinical pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetic and toxicity. I'm addressing toxicity today here. Clinical safety and efficacy. They are developed alongside and jointly. And this is very much included in the International Conference, which is now International Council for Harmonization. And it has taken uh, to develop for regional national implementation. So ICH does not create international legislation. Forget it, not possible. ICH leaves the regional and national legislation sit there on its own and is creating guidelines. So it is uh, below the radar of legislation. And sometimes legislation must be changed, but this would then be done nationally, locally, later. So the uh, ICH has taken to develop technical and scientific guidelines in the areas quality, safety, efficacy, and also multidisciplinary. And they also set standards in, in how to, to word certain things, and they have developed a common technical document, which means that you submit the same standardized document uh, to all uh, the regions which are included in ICH, which is a major achievement which has been, which has, uh, been done. <laughs> Just a short word about ICH. Uh, it, it started 1990 in Brussels with the initial six-pack regulatory agencies from Europe, Japan, and US, and industry associations from Europe, Japan, and US worked together, and they created working groups, and I created the term six-packs for that, and uh, since 2017, it's more focusing on global regulatory harmonization because the guidelines by now are available. So the membership of the new ICH has grown and there's almost worldwide contribution and membership in this. So it's no longer US, Japan, and Europe, but it's, it's practically worldwide participation. And there's listings and I will show you. Work products are developed jointly and implemented regionally. So you have a ICH international guideline and it goes to FDA for implementation it, or to the government for implementation. It goes to European Union for implementation. So there is uh, regular and irregular meetings at several levels and currently we have 61 guidelines and standards included in ICH, and there is uh, approximately 20 topics ongoing. And we have right now in ICH 10 regulatory members where the 27 of Europe are counted as one. So if you put this number on, you come to the middle 50 number of countries. And you have industry associations worldwide regional initiatives, etc., And the whole thing is, is supported and run by the International Federation for Pharmaceutical Sciences and WHO, and they're also stand, standing observers. 
So this leads me to reprodux testing uh, that started with a EU guidance on the chemical side, uh, but it was meant to be for all types of products. There was a European Commission working group uh, with Lady Marie-Thérèse van der Fenne from the Commission, and she was pushing uh, all of us to, to, to come forward with, with a draft. And when this draft became available in the early 90s, we had uh, further contributions from U.S., Japanese, European regulatory authorities and WHO, U.S., Japanese, European pharmaceutical industry associations, and I remember talking to, uh, uh, to the Kimmels at EPA, so it was not only discussions at, at, at FDA and pharmaceuticals, but we tried to have one guideline for chemicals and pharmaceuticals alike. As it turns out, it became a guideline for pharmaceuticals. So we finally had a discussion at the uh, international Territology, Federation of Territorial Society meeting with all the four regional societies, and they uh, introduced further suggestions and changes, and many experts in the field. So we all agreed on one draft guideline on detection of toxicity reproduction for medicinal products. So this was adopted in 1993 and it was the first ICH guideline ever to be adopted in the ICH system, and it's my guideline. And we have there a three-segment approach as most probable option, and we have uh, many designs which can be used, and we have to address a number of functions and periods during this, and this is, I think, very straightforward. And this guideline has survived, the, has stood the, the, the time, and it, it is currently uh, re under revision again, and it caters for provision of proper testing scenarios and their combination to be applied when appropriate and needed according to another guideline, which is one of the multidisciplinary guidelines, which is the guidance on non-clinical safety studies for the conduct of human clinical trials and marketing authorization. So now we are no longer working in a silo of toxicity testing, but we are working in a community where the uh, uh, clinical people are saying, I need information uh, about something, how are you going to give it to me? And then tests are, will be performed. And so it's, it's, it's no longer preclinical, but it's non-clinical, and it's a long side development, and it is observed by the regulatory authorities and by the ethics committees uh, looking into clinical trials. So I think this is very important. It caters for the timing, not only for the timing, but also for which drug is to, and um, um, which uh, met, met methods, which toxicity testing to apply, uh, and, and, and these guidelines uh, uh, co-influence each other. So in the past, pre- and non-clinical safety studies needed to be performed well in advance of clinical testing scenarios. So, Preclinic was always running ahead and, of course, doing many things which were interesting and good and doing many things which later on proved unnecessary. So this change of paradigm where we are now looking into the requirements of a specific clinical trial and does it need further support by non-clinical studies. I think this is the change which we have which we have done in the ICH and which is very important to do. Of course, for reprotox, this is not easy because um, if you remember the little mite story, it introduced reprodux testing very early, a complete set, everything needed to be done very early. And now all of a sudden, it started here in the US that FDA reported to ICH 
Look, there is women of childbearing potential who want to be included into early clinical trials. And you would say, ah, it's impossible. How can you do this? So this was to be achieved, and it led to the current version of the, of the guideline. And we can look at men, we can look at women of not childbearing potential, and we can look at women of childbearing potential. Men in phase one and two trials can be included in the trial before the male fertility studies are, uh, are done. Women of not childbearing potential can, uh, uh, can be included uh, even um, before reprotox studies are done because we also have available repeat dose toxicity. Now, the important area is women of childbearing potential where you want to really minimize risk. So you have the convention of the guideline that early clinical trials up to two weeks are possible without early embryo fetal studies. Clinical trials up to three months are possible before definite reprotox testing is there. This introduces the term preliminary small testing and definite big testing. And many testing, the preliminary testing will suffice. There is a specialty in the US for clinical trials before phase three. These are possible. Uh, and the assessment of embryo studies can be deferred. OK, and so it, it shows that uh, it's possible to include women of childbearing potential relatively early in clinical trial. So this comes to the numbers of animals. I think it's always also important to look at numbers. And it used to be 700 non-rodent, non-rodent, and it's now between 0, 200, maybe 500 rodent and non-rodent animals which are included. Just a very short look at, the other, at some other ICH achievements. Repeat those toxicity studies, and I will show you first this one. This was in 1990, and you see uh, going up the duration of animal exposure, and on the right, the duration of the clinical trial. So for one week to one month clinical trial, you would need between three and 18 months toxicity studies which is absolutely crazy. And if you look at clinical trials up to three months, you have a different build of picture. And for three months and longer, you still have 18 months. So the, the, there were different intentions from this to reduce 18 months down lower and to harmonize the requirements which were in the areas. And this, this has happened and uh, it eliminated regional duplication of studies. It eliminated nine and 12 month studies, very few exceptions. And it abandoned three and six month studies where development is discontinued. And I think it's very important to understand the earlier a drug development is discontinued, the more animals are saved. Similarly for carcinogenicity studies, uh, the requirement for two studies, for two long-term studies, is uh, very much under discussion. Uh, we will not completely get rid of it, but it will be one long-term and one short-term study in the future, not to talk anything further. And uh, so, it, again, it reduces the number of animals. Uh, overall, ICH has introduced better science. Uh, the, the number of animals typically used for a long-term use pharmaceutical has been halved. And now we have an addition in, in uh, non-clinical testing, which is juvenile animal testing, because uh, companies are pushed to develop drugs very early for pediatric uh, populations. And of course, this is looking for a counterpart in, in experimental, and, and this may, uh, may use one, one animal species, uh, but it's, it's to be continued. We don't know yet. Uh, in the annex, I have uh, given you 
some more details about ICH, about the purpose of ICH, about the steps of ICH, the guidelines which are available in the safety area. Uh, overall, the number of animals which are used in here, 1997. And for those who want to look at it, uh, you can look at my, some, some parts of my CV. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>